Hello, everyone, and welcome to the August 19th edition of the Decaterish.com Twitch show. I am your host, editor, and publisher, Dan Wisenhunt. we got a good show for you today. Uh, our special guest is going to be State Rep. Mary Margaret Oliver. Uh, she will be joined a little bit later, hopefully, by State Senator Elena Parent. Uh, Representative Oliver, how are you today? I'm well. Thanks for the invitation. I appreciate being with you. Well, we're always glad to see you. Thank you for joining us. And Decatur's contributor, George Cheedy, is with us as well. George, how are you? Woo! I'm good. Thank you, George. We appreciate you coming by once again. So um, the way this works is we're going to just talk about whatever. We're going to talk about the elections. We're going to talk about what happened in the legislature. If you have a question... Uh, go ahead and create a Twitch profile and give us a follow and you can ask your question. Um, we will check uh, the questions at every 15 minutes or so just to see what you have to say. And uh, yeah, let's have some fun. We're looking forward to it. So uh, Mary Margaret Oliver, real quickly, just for the readers who may not know who you are, can you tell us briefly um, who you are and what your district is, what, what the people that you represent? Thank you. 82nd House District starts in DeKalb County, basically where the old courthouse is, where the Confederate monument was, and goes up Claremont Road all the way to the other side of 85, and I'm on both sides of Claremont Road. I include all of Emory University, all of that campus. I represent four cities, Decatur, Atlanta, uh, Chambly, uh, and Brookhaven, and uh, it's everything in between. All of that is basically unincorporated DeKalb. I'm a native of DeKalb County. I went to Fernbank and Druid Hills High School and Emory Law School. And I've had a, a law practice on the square of Decatur for decades. Um, and I have been in and out of politics. I've had uh, three different offices. I ran statewide and lost a couple of uh, a while ago. And Happy to be back in the house now, represent the 82nd District, my hometown turf. And how long have you been in the, uh, this current position? This current position, a long time. I came back in 2003. This is the longest office I've heard, I've held. Half of my political career has been in the majority party and half has been in the minority party. So recently we wrapped up the legislative session uh, here in Georgia. Can you tell us a little bit about how that went? I know it was it was weird because we started and then we had to adjourn because of COVID and then we resumed and kind of finished our business and then we adjourned again. There's some talk about bringing the legislature back potentially to fix a bill, which is kind of strange, but we can get to that in a second. Can, can you go over some of the, the high points of this year's legislative session for us? I think weird weird is the operative word. It, it's very much a weird session. And when I went to the Capitol on the morning of March 12th, which happened to be crossover day, which is a, I, I got there about 730 and I thought I'd be there till midnight. It was a day that when one bill has to pass one chamber, or the other to get time. And when I went to the Capitol at, that morning, early morning, I thought it was a normal day. And by 9 a.m., um, I had become aware that we were going to be shutting down. We suspended our operation uh, on March 12th with no idea when we'd come back. And we reconvened on June 15th for the final 11 days of the session, completed our 40 day session uh, on June 29th. Our only statutory obligation, as you know, is to pass a budget. And so on June, between June 15th and June 29th, we had to pass the fiscal 21 year budget. It's always the most important thing we do. And in this very, very strange time, trying to predict the revenues for fiscal year 21, which began July 1st, 2020, and went to June 30th, 2021, is an unusual task. What will the economy do? And how much of the $29 billion budget do we have to cut between June 15th and June 29th? I'm on the Appropriations Committee, and we had passed what I considered sort of a preview of a normative budget in March before we left, uh, but it was irrelevant by late June. So the budget was a very significant, very uh, difficult 
unusual process. The other, the highlight, the positives was the hate crime bill. Uh, there was some ugly sausage making going on uh, that got us to a vote. Uh, there was some unhappiness about that. Uh, and then we passed two or three other relevant things. I think the Senior Citizens Protection Bill was a good bill. Um, improve the staffing ratios for people, older people in assisted living. Uh, impose some necessary uh, protections. Uh, but it was very weird, very weird. The last 11 days in the Capitol without lobbyists, without staff, without coffee. There was no coffee. Nobody to make coffee. Um, that's it was terrible. very weird. It was a hardship, no coffee. So I don't want to interrupt you too much, but I did want to acknowledge <laughs> that our state senator, Elena Parent, has joined us. Elena, how the heck are you today? I'm great. How are you, Dan? Thanks so much for having me. Sorry uh, I can't be here the whole time. Well, no, we appreciate you taking any time to join us. Uh, senator Parent, can you really quick tell people uh, who you are and who you represent So for people who might be unfamiliar? Absolutely. Um, I'm State Senator Elena Parent. I represent District 42 uh, in the State Senate. That district is entirely composed within DeKalb County. So DeKalb is my only county. Um, I've got parts of Atlanta. I've got all of Decatur. I've got all of Avondale States. Goes south of um, Decatur some down through the Candler Road and Peachcrest, um, Candler McAfee and Peachcrest areas as well. Um, I've got the southern parts of Brookhaven and Chambly, so I go all the way north through the Emory CDC area to get up there. And we were just chatting with uh, Mary Margaret Oliver about what a what a really weird session this has been uh, because it started, it adjourned uh, because of COVID, uh, and then it resumed, uh, and then it has adjourned again. There's been some talk about possibly bringing the legislature back to fix a bill. Uh, and apparently there was no coffee. Uh, so you all clearly had it worse than I we did. We had coffee in the Senate. I okay. hate to tell the Senate, Mary Margaret. The Senate had <laughs> coffee. The members were not allowed to have The Senate had coffee, and we, were, we weren't we were really mask optional, but that, the Senate did not do as good of a job as the House and the Speaker at sort of trying to enforce social distancing and mask wearing. Um, they set up through through their chamber and maybe maybe you already said this Mary Margaret and and through the appropriations room and voted by voice we just all had our desks they set up a couple other areas where um you know were blocked off so no no public could come in and senators could be in there and social distance sort of in front of the chamber and they had TVs on so you could watch the live feed and just kind of go back in to vote but there was no social distancing set up that would be mandated or followed the way they had in the house. And uh, remarkably, it doesn't seem like there were a whole lot of cases that arose out of the, out of the session itself after it resumed. I know there were some cases right. before it adjourned, but I don't think there were any m cases that. None came. have been reported. Yeah. Some people lie about it though. So you can't yeah. know for sure. Right. So, but um, because when we got back, we heard all these rumors that, because we had, I think, five or six senators publicly announced that they had had uh, coronavirus, you know, got it uh, right around the time we were shutting down and recovered, thankfully. But when we got back, there were a variety of rumors about other people that just had sort of had it and not admitted it. Um, yeah. I don't know if the information is really correct after yeah. June 29th. I, I felt like I believe one identity of one person, but... I'm guessing there were more, but people had gone quiet. Right, right. But it wasn't, I will say it doesn't seem like there was a humongous outbreak either. And, and right, I do think exactly. that people yeah. mostly followed rules. And um, that obviously helped keep, keep the uh, numbers away or down during our resumption of session. The people that were not wearing any masks were the, all the state troopers, which drove all of us crazy. They were all congregating okay. all over the place staring at our live feed TVs right outside the Senate chamber and wearing zero masks. And Senator Sally Harrell actually went to the well and made a speech about it. <laughs> yeah, that was, I thought that was very bad form. And, it was. And Senator, <laughs> S Senator Kausert never wore a mask. He's the one that irritated me most visibly to yep. me. We had a few senators that were, yeah. Dive them all down. Objectors. So uh, Senator Parent, since your time here is limited and we do have a lot of 
important things to talk about. I wanted to, I got this question before you came on. Real quickly, can you talk about Vista Grove, where that stands, and why you have decided to support that bill uh, for Vista Grove Cityhood? Because I want to, I want to address that and then move on. Sure. Um, well, I mean, as you know, that is a lengthy conversation, so sure. we'll try to. We might have to do our own episode about it at some point, but. Yeah, I mean, so, okay, I'm trying to think the best way to answer it. So we did not, um, decisions were made sort of, first of all, as a group. I was the, you know, person whose name the bill was filed under, but Representative Oliver, Senator Harrell, and I made sort of decisions together, some, the three of us, but also in conjunction with other representatives that represent the area. Um, so, those the conversations weren't happening in isolation. Um, we decided that we would not uh, push for the bill during the resume session for obvious reasons. That just the timing is wrong, and something divisive like that, you know, needs a lot of discussion and study. Plus, we wanted to move it as a local bill, which would mean that we would need the majority of the Senate delegation on board, and we knew that now was not the time to try to. Um, in the middle of a pandemic have these intensive conversations about the future of cities and the future of DeKalb County government. So that being said, we have had discussions with the Vista Grove folks. We are supportive of what they are trying to do. We have not made any promises about filing it again next year. It just sort of remains to be seen what's happening on the ground. And I'm sure that Representative Oliver will weigh in. But some of the reasons that we decided that we should place a bill in for discussion and consideration include um, a number of recent fairly large annexations into mostly Brookhaven, which has its own police force. The Carl Vinson Institute report that was commissioned by the county that um, laid out the revenue losses to the county under different scenarios and made clear that um, police being the most expensive public service that uh, were a Vista Grove with police to form, that would be a lot more damaging than a Vista Grove without, that partnered with DeKalb Police, or having that whole area go to a Chambly or a Brookhaven or a Dorval that already have their own police departments. So we felt that there was a strong argument that a, that if annexations were going to continue and municipalization conversations were going to continue, a, a smaller city that partnered with DeKalb County versus a city with police and it more full service would actually be a more beneficial scenario for everyone in the county. And we were in a position to be able to ensure that that happened. So we set some parameters out, conditions under which we were willing to file the bill in the first place. We do think it's worthy of discussion. That mean, And that discussion really is, what does the future of DeKalb look like? And we do want a lot of voices at the table on that because there isn't a right way or a wrong way. The county is always going to be here and play a really important role. Well, I, but we want equity and fairness too. So it's, a, it's complicated. I appreciate your answer on that. And I do think that we need to potentially uh, do a, a specific episode on Vista Grove. Uh, at some point, uh, because there is a lot of ground to cover. I, I will tell you a more pressing concern, and one that is going to be a topic of Friday's show, is is securing our vote, uh, making sure that we're all going to be able to vote and have our votes counted uh, this year, because there's a lot of talk about, you know, mail not getting delivered on time. What What mm -hmm. can you do? What is being done at your mm -hmm. level to ensure that we're all going to get our votes counted in time for this election. Oh, yeah. There, there's a lot happening. Um, the Government Affairs Committee, where I serve on the House, was tasked by Speaker Ralston to do an investigation as to the issues and possible proposals for based on the June 9th debacle. We operate on two assumptions. One, the COVID rules are still going to apply on November 3rd and that uh, we're going to have the highest voter turnout in the history of Georgia. We have to make the absentee ballot and early voting options more user friendly and more available and more encouraging to people to use. The Government Affairs Committee has had three public hearings. We have live streamed everything and the chairman 
who's uh, Shaw Blackman from Warner Robins, has invited people to submit comments uh, uh, online to their proposals for ideas. We distilled that list to 35 different po possible remedies, possible suggestions for improvement. It was a good list. And this week, the members of the committee have voted, close quote, voted. Um, my deadline was Thursday. I submitted my list of my priorities. And the Government Affairs Committee has, I think, is going to produce a really good list of possible changes. For instance, absentee ballots need to be started to be not only um, collected for the entire uh, three weeks in the drop boxes, but also counted and scanned. The scanning, of the, there's a lot of details about logistics and technology, but uh, there's a very strong awareness that the debacle of June 9th has to be remedied and with some effort, some of it's minimal effort, some of it is not so minimal, we can improve the opportunity for the voter. The national discussion about the post office is incomprehensible, intentionally incomprehensible by the acts of the president in my view, but there is no doubt that most people, more people than ever, statistically most people are gonna vote by absentee and that the drop box drop off of your ballot is what I recommend. Yeah, I mean, that's my plan. I'm sorry, Senator Perrin, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, 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 I was, I was just, um, I wholeheartedly concur with um, Representative Oliver, and I'm so glad that her committee is doing this work. Um, also, a lot of our constituents in our area have watched the operations of the DeKalb Board of Elections very carefully. Yeah. And with their um, we have a reporter input, parked down there right now. So right with their their input and and rallying um, a lot of people, they were able to, you know, I think be a big part of why they hired a consultant and a huge part of why some of those key recommendations were adopted um, at the county board of elections level. And so I think that work is also really important. And I think it's moving in the right direction. Um, at, at that at, at the DeKalb board, but I do think that we do still, I'm not criticizing them, but I just, uh, you know, we're in a totally different era. So improvements are needed everywhere. And when you're a huge urban county, you know, you just constantly need to be reevaluating. And so that's what I think our people are helping them do. I think that's what the consultants are helping them do. And I think they're hard at work. And so that's a, that's a good thing. And, and we should continue that work. George and there was a federal court hearing. There was a federal court hearing this morning on some important absentee issues. Yep. And I'm very curious what judge, uh, federal judge Eleanor Ross will do. For instance, should absentee ballots that are postmarked on election day, mm. postmarked on election day, received within five days be counted? That's one of the issues before the judge. Both Pennsylvania and two other states by court order have directed that absentee ballots postmarked on the election day must be counted. 100%. I mean, there's just yeah. no any other fair way to do it. Secretary of State's very much against that, so I'm hoping that the federal court will save us on that. George, you want to weigh in? Absolutely. Yeah, just a little bit. You are not Fine. in control of the mail, so, and if you're allowed to mail it, then as long as it's postmarked, it, it should work. I don't need to preach right. to the choir, but I concur that using the drop-off is safer. I, I yeah. agree. I live in Pine Lake, and like the beautiful, the lovely Pine Lake, population 700 something on a good day and we all have to get our mail at the post office because we don't get delivery at the houses like we're too small as a zip code someone uh took out our post office uh, about two weeks ago it was an accident it was an older driver who was parked in front thought she was going in in forward and she had it in reverse and backed her car through the front wall of the Pine Lake Post Office. And so it is closed right now. And some part of me is looking at that going, you're going to take your time fixing this, aren't you? Like, because that's where we are as a society, where the motivations of the people who run the post office are questionable. I, I can't feel like we're in like the bizarro timeline where I have to even worry and wonder about that sort of thing. I'm shocked. Um, but yeah, it means I am definitely hand carrying my ballot to the, to the county elections office and handing it to somebody just to be sure, because that's where we are. 
Colorado has drive-by drop box, drive-by to your polling place on election day. And my Colorado mm-hmm. consultant piece says the most popular way people drive by and hand it to an elected official, yep. a bipartisan election expert judge will physically take your ballot on election day at your precinct, which is cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I, I also disagree in some in some respect that um, it's totally beneficial to Donald Trump to to interfere with it the way that he's interfering with it. Oh, yeah. he, it it's it's so gonna right. affect his voters too. Um, right. You know, we're it's 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 gonna cut across all swaths of the electorate. So, you know, I I think the the real intent based on everything he does is to sow doubt about the mm-hmm. outcome. Uh, it's not really yeah. to win. It's to make everyone doubt the outcome uh, right. so they can try to hold on to power, uh, which is scary as shit. Uh, the other thing that's scary... I'm sorry, George. Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't want to cut you off. But, no, go ahead. Um, I'm just... I'm glad that Senator Parent is here. Um, uh, I wrote a piece uh, a couple of weeks ago about uh, unemployment problems. Mm. Um, the uh, When you're you and other senators and other representatives for protesting. I am curious about whether or not, because all I got from the DOL as I was looking at that on that day was kind of snark. Like, I'm wondering whether or not they have improved over snark in terms of, of being responsive to you. Not that I've seen. I mean, we had this meeting scheduled with the Senate Democratic Caucus with the commissioner and he or somebody, I guess, presumably him, got annoyed that some of the representatives and I think some senders were there too, and protested or you know called on him to handle the backlog out at a Gwinnett office yeah. and actually sent an email saying, due to protests, uh, we will, we will not, I refuse to now meet with you, which is so snarky, childish, petty, makes you look bad, not what you're elected to do. The thing is, we would be glad to partner with him towards solutions. So I've seen nothing but unreasonable petty behavior. Gosh, I, I'm glad that you keyed me in to looking at how the Department of Labor is re, is in the relationship with elected officials right now. Um, because I, I mean, I had a conversation with the, with the, with the director, the, uh, the commissioner. Um, there is one thing that I'm sort of chewing on um, there was an allusion to a very serious fraud problem going on yes. that hasn't really emerged in the public yet. And I touched on it in the story. Um, it's not individual fraud. I mean, there's some of that, but I legitimately don't think he cares all that much. Um, like that there's some big corporate fraud coming down that like some like organized crime level, seven figure, eight figure problem that they've been trying to figure out and that that's to some degree slowing up the works i don't know about about fraud um and said that he believes some of the recent spike could be attributable to fraud you uh, you're more in the know about the mafia connection slash organized crime i think yeah I I wish I were like I've been poking around at the attorney general's office and I'm not getting anywhere. They're being very close to the vest about it. Um, so I was expecting to see news on that last week and it didn't come out, which means it might actually be more than I thought. I don't know. Uh, well, I am anti unemployment insurance fraud. Let me just make that clear. <laughs> yeah, no, or yeah. Organized. <laughs> so I don't mind there being like a vetting process, but the reality is desperate individuals have totally clogged up our emails and our phone lines. And my assistant has, has been able to really deal with nothing else, which she doesn't mind. It's heartbreaking, but of course she doesn't mind. And, and it's just interesting because it's not actually our job, you know, and then you just get really concerned by eviction starting and the compounding of all the pain. And we, and we really don't, we want, we, we do not want fraud but we don't want legitimate complicated claims to go to the point where families have been thrown out in the street because that serves no purpose. Well, I want to call bullshit on, on the whole idea that this purported fraud should be slowing up the crank, the, the claims. The reality of it is 
you can prosecute fraud whenever. <laughs> you know, you you don't have all that many chances to pay your rent. Um, so right. I'm, I'm 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 kind of ambivalent about that whole idea. Like, okay, sure, if there's fraud, definitely investigate it. But I'm not sure why that would hold up the processing of otherwise legitimate claims. Um, I think it's better for the public to just make sure that err on the side of people getting the money that they need. And if there's a problem, uh, you know, deal with that when that comes to light. I don't know why one has to be dealt with before the other. Uh, it, it just, it sounds very suspicious to me personally, but I'm a suspicious guy. So I don't know. No. This, the thing with the evictions is what I've been trying to keep my eye on right now. Like, and I expect to write at length about that soon. Um, the evictions court just started up again, like two weeks ago. I, and uh, I'm not the only one watching, thank God. Uh, NPR's had a reporter watching this stuff regularly since it started up too. Um, I know you're getting a lot of phone calls and emails on unemployment stuff. Have you started getting phone calls and emails on housing and eviction stuff? I'd like to ask both of you that. I have not, but I anticipate it. Um, I used to be the eviction, I used to be a magistrate court judge. So I did eviction hearings as that judge and a bunch of other odd stuff that have stuck with me in my legislative career. That judge work stuck, stuck with me. It's such a, it's the most incredibly devastating thing to do is to put people out. And the logistics of putting people out of their home is a complicated, messy, and uphill battle just to manage it and if you're looking at the court side of it if you're looking at the marshal side of it and the service side of it and the physically hauling crap away side of it no way that the county can accomplish that if you're looking at the tenant side of it they're going to be out <laughs> they're going to be out on the street it's going to be a devastating impact on DeKalb County specifically well, I would encourage anybody facing eviction to not participate in the process. Don't show up to court. Don't answer their letters. Don't participate because this is not your fault, generally. If you ain't got your unemployment and you can't pay the bills, because they can't evict everyone, especially if you don't participate. That's that's my public service announcement. Gum up, <laughs> gum up the works. I'm serious. Gum it up. Make it so damned impossible to get anything done that they can't evict you. That's, that's well, I, my uh, PSA. Dan, uh, my advice to people legally on how to gum it up would be a little bit more complicated than that. But uh, <laughs> gum it up is always an issue for the tenant. Yeah, I'm sure it's more complicated than I'm making it. But um, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, I'm literally so angry these days that I'm ready to set <laughs> things on fire. Um, that's, you know, I, I, I'm just so fed up with, I've seen, I've seen what that looks like. I'm, yeah. I'm close. Uh, enough. uh, you know, I was, I was doing school with my kid today. You know, we we're on two, so we do two days of digital learning. He's in the kindergarten. He's starting kindergarten at a computer because that's the world that we live in. And he has this anxiety about it. You know, a real deep, he even told me this kid's five and told me, I am nervous about school. And I don't think it's like your typical nervousness around school. I think it's a nervousness about the situation and how he's going to be evaluated. And I, and I wanted to ask Elena and Mary Margaret, how the hell are we going to get out of this mess with COVID? Because I, Brian Kemp, uh, his Twitter is just infuriating. And, and the way he has responded to criticism has been to basically gaslight everybody, to tell everyone that what you see is not actually what you see, and everything right. is great, and everything is fine. Well, my kid can't go to kindergarten, so I don't think things are great. You know, if they were great, my son wouldn't be learning his ABCs at a freaking computer. So how do we get ourselves out of this mess? How, what do we do? What can we do? And that's what I want to hear our legislators speak to. Well, okay. So we're not, Governor Kemp is wrong that when you don't have mandates on things, people are, he's wrong that when you, ha, that not having a mandate, that having a mandate won't result in more mask wearing. That's what I'm trying to get at. Like, he's like, I think Georgians will do the right thing. No, because 
sends a signal that it's not necessary when people like him and Donald Trump don't wear masks. And so you just, everyone needs to be really clear. We're in an age of all kinds of disinformation, misinformation. Everyone, we're suffering because we're not having good leadership that's having a strong, cohesive plan and a decisive message. So what we need is that. And right now we're not doing well because we don't have that out of the governor's office or the um, the president, you know, out of the White House, really. So, I mean, if we could get to me, the masks make the most sense in the world because you can still conduct business. You can still go to school. We just did session. The mask is just not that big a deal. I don't get any of this BS. And by the way, it does not violate your constitutional rights to wear a mask. So just shut up. And if you don't want to wear it, you can stay home. How about that? You know, so um, I don't think we're going to have a vaccine ready, you know, obviously for at least six to 10 months to deploy it would be another six to 10 months. So this is going to be with us for a long time. So we need better ways to cope, you know, I mean, and I do think a number of these things are off the table right now. You know, no, we really shouldn't be tailgating. No, there really shouldn't be big parties. No, there shouldn't really be concerts. But, you know, you could you could be safe doing other things like going to the grocery store, like, um, you know, having your kids go to school with with structure in place. I do think that that would be possible if we had a culture here in Georgia that had that had benefited from some strong leadership that had been able to bring our numbers down a little bit. I absolutely think that schools could open under those circumstances. It's it is about leadership. There's no question. It's about leadership. Uh, Vermont, New York, and New Jersey, three very different states. Uh, leadership is such that the COVID virus incident report is lowering, lowering, lowering. People are feeling uh, some success in some parts of the country where there have been, uh, where there's been good examples of good leadership. We have had poor leadership in Georgia, and Trump is not worth my time even discussing uh, in terms of how obviously his leadership is, has failed. We're all going to lose a year. Now for me, yeah. and uh, I'm, um, I'm, I'm lucky. Um, I don't have to try to teach a, a five-year-old his ABCs, and I don't have to teach a middle school his math, which I would be very unable to do. I'm not financially stressed by it. I can, uh, I don't have a elderly person in my home like I have in the past that I'm, I mean, I've been lucky, but the way in which young families, particularly young families where two parents are working to pay bills or single parents are working to pay all the bills is just impossible to manage in this current circumstances. And we have to plan a minimum of a year. Dr. Fauci, this, this, I, I paused in my steps when I heard him say this, he will consider it a success if 50% of the vaccine patients are successful. In other words, initiating a vaccine means 50% will be protected. So we are a very long way away from any kind of vaccine cure. And unless we all change our behavior in a very significant way, i.e. wearing masks, i.e. wearing masks, uh, we're going to continue to be in a lot of trouble. And the economic assault on our society, I mean, on our state budget, is something I think about a lot in terms of as we're monitoring our budget uh, appropriations coming in and going out every single day. Uh, we are in a, a world of hurt, and families, young families particularly, are the ones I'm worried about most. I, don't now, think I'm, I know I'm fortunate, but um, believe me, if my kids were a little younger, if I didn't have help, luckily I have an au pair who already lived with us. So how lucky is that, right? Yeah. So people I knew were paying their nannies for months and months and months, which they wanted to do. You know, but but didn't they weren't coming in, right? You know, I mean, yeah. they on the social distance, like we're on lockdown. So, <laughs> so I I, I I count myself as 100 percent blessed, but I do need to run right now. Yeah, um, Senator Parent, thank you so much for joining us. You're awesome. I'm yeah, grateful. And, uh, I owe you always. Yeah. We, oh, George, I love you. And, I love everyone on this show. And uh, yeah, if only please. we were in charge, none of this asinine crap would be happening. <laughs> right, Mary Margaret. 
Right. Gonna, uh, no. Go no. If I were in charge, it's it's entirely different. Um, but yeah, Senator Parrot, please join us again. Uh, hopefully, we can do another episode uh, when you're got a little more time. I would love that, and thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Senator Parrot. Have a good evening. You too. Bye, all. It is getting ready to storm big time outside. Oh, I see it. Yeah, that's why I need to go turn on my light real quick. Just bear with me, um, because it's yeah. getting dark. So this thing, like we were talking about evictions a minute ago, like the um, the marshal's office does, and I ran into the marshal's guys at the protest in Stone Mountain, which is the thing I'm going to write about for tomorrow for Decaturish. Um, the uh, um, the marshals don't really have a good plan for how they're going to handle these evictions. Like that's just not coming. Like they're they don't have the manpower to deal with. No way. No way. No. There's no way. Like which is why the gum up the works thing is probably on point. Like if it's going to take them six months to get around to evict right. them, um, then maybe you just do it. Although. Like there's this question of what it does to everybody's credit and their eviction history and all that. Just... So I work on homelessness stuff when I'm not writing. And the th one, like the big barrier is, it's not even money. It's what does your credit history look like? And do you have an eviction on your record? Right. You've got an eviction on your record, you're done. Like nobody's, nobody's running to you for three years probably. Um, and if a, like one out of 10 households in DeKalb County ends up getting evicted, like either those criteria are fundamentally going to change or you're going to have a lot of people being homeless. Um, and that's why I'm looking at this crazy 40 million person number, like that 40 million people will be evicted. I'm like, yeah, okay. But you're like the entire edifice of, residential real estate collapses under those conditions like right there's a third of residences are rentals like if you're like what are you going to evict somebody and then have somebody else move in who wasn't evicted except that's absolutely everybody who's on the market now i mean what do you to me like, it's just it move? reminds me of like a christopher durang play where you know, something really patently absurd and outrageous is going on, and everybody's being asked to pretend as if it's normal. And that's and that's really what the the evictions feels like to me. Is we shouldn't even this shouldn't even be a discussion, right? Like there should not be a discussion about what are we going to do if forty million people are evicted. That just that should not be happening under the circumstances because these are not people who have screwed off and you know haven't paid their bills and haven't done the right things. By and large, most of them have done everything that's been asked of them. They got up, they went to work, they took care of themselves, they took care of their families, and now through absolutely no fault of their own, they're going to basically be told, sorry, tough shit, we'll see you later. Like, that to me is just fundamentally crazy. And I, and what, I, is the, what is the likelihood, in either of your opinion, that <clears throat> the House and the Senate DC are going to reach an agreement for 300 or 400 or 500 dollars a week. What's the likelihood of that? Because I have no idea. I don't either. Um, I was shocked that they hadn't done it already. And the fact that they're walking right. away for a month is some indication that they want to see. They, somebody is calculating that it will require the pain in order to get people off, off the pot. You know what I mean? Like, that these like Republican elected officials, like a Republican congressman, have to be getting the phone calls that you're getting and that Elena is getting, like for long enough for them to be freaked out about whether or not they're going to lose their own seats to come back to the table. I, it's the only thing that makes any sense to me because I can't believe they're not arguing about it right now. The Republican Congress people have to be getting phone calls from developers who own massive amounts of apartments. They have to be getting those phone calls. I had a, a political call today with a, a developer, not on a not on a COVID issue, but on an issue of um, DOT stuff. And we were talking about his industry, what part of his industry was going to crash and burn. And those are the people Republicans are going to listen to. I mean, not uh, not yeah. not 
be in you, George. I mean, and so the major moneyed interest that have their develop. You look at the apartments in the city of Decatur that rent for three thousand dollars a month. <laughs> Tell me exactly who the investor is on those. And I'm I'm involved through my law practice in some development over on the west side, which is a fascinating. Talk about fascinating, different world from Decatur. The the per, the development of a part high end apartments, there's there's unbelievable amount of investment in those issues. Those are the people that have to be talking to those Congress Republican congressmen, and saying if you don't your your whole congressional district is going to sink <laughs> by Thursday if you don't do something. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to be like financially weird here for a second. Like I'm going to put the NBA hat on just for a minute. Like in a sane world, what Congress and the president would have done by now is basically told the banks to eat it. Like, okay, we just handed you $500 billion in capital and we're buying all of your assets. Like the Fed right now owns about 7% of the financial assets on Wall Street because they've been buying this stuff as a quantitative measure in order to maintain prices. Um, that they would say, no evictions, leave the people who are there in place. No foreclosures. And, no and no foreclosures. And hey, banks, you can't foreclose and roll that money back to the back of the loan that they'll owe you. And so don't collect on the don't collect on the mortgages, freeze the mortgages, add it to the back, and yeah, you're gonna eat it. Like that's what that's what normal would look like. And that's what most of the rest of the world has done. How much money did the banks make, George? You probably know this on the distribution of COVID loans to businesses. I mean, the billions of dollars that went out through those banks, they charged fees for that. They the did. money was immediately in their hands, immediately in their pocket. The banks up until today, have probably been in a profit mode based on COVID. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, like everything I'm seeing on Wall Street makes no sense. The idea that Wall Street, the, that the Dow Jones Industrial Average is today higher than it was before the crash six months ago, three months or four months ago, is ludicrous based on what productivity looks like. We've had a productivity crash, like we like a third, like it's ridiculous like ridiculous crash in GDP. And the stock market is where it was before COVID hit. What is the impact of the private equity funds owning these apartments as opposed to publicly traded entities and public developers? That's what I can't figure out. That's the people that the con need to be calling their congressmen. Yeah, I would think. Um, and um, I mean, private equity is weird in general. And part of it is that there's been all, there's been a lot of, money sloshing around before COVID. Like everybody was liquid in January. Like the highest, like a lot of people had already taken all of their money off the table and were spending cash before COVID hit because there was an expectation that something terrible was going to happen. Um, it wasn't, I'm not being conspiratorial, that had been building for years and it's just sort of part of the natural cycle. So what I suspect is a lot of these guys um had like they pushed their private their money into private equity firms for these for, for real estate except you would assume commercial real estate's about to get slaughtered just destroyed nobody's going to work nobody's going back to an office after this like you should assume 20 percent of the commercial real estate that's out there is dead just dead because nobody's companies that can operate virtually have been in like the world's largest experiment on virtual office work in history. And some of them are making it work and it will never go back to a communal office, office ever again. Office parks are a bad, are gone. They're just gone. Office parks are gone. Yeah. So I don't know what the hell is going on there. Nothing makes sense. So nothing um, financially makes sense. We, we have a question from, believe it or not, uh, we are supposed to be taking questions. Uh, I think Mary Margaret is uh, 
dealing Stepped away from her dog. Yeah, dealing with her dog. Uh, so we're. Gonna... I'm sorry about the dog. I was trying to go outside, but it's pouring out rain. Um, oh really? Uh, you know, like it's start, like, dog, I'm starting to get it here. The dog can join us if the dog wants. Yeah, to. we're cool with that. We're 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 pretty we like casual. Dogs. Um, uh, we do have a question. Hey, puppy. Um, it's a dog. A, a, a reader asks, uh, can we discuss redistricting and the timeline for redistricting? And um, that would be a question I would direct to Mary Margaret. In normal times, these are not, we will have a special session in 2021 and redistrict based on the census that's collected in 2020. The fact that the census is uh, woefully behind and Trump has intentionally underfunded it um, is making all that confusing. I uh, think we probably will still reapportion in the, in the fall or maybe the summer, I don't know, of 2021, but what will the data be based on the delay and the COVID delays and the intentional delays of Trump? We are, a lot of people are Worried about that a lot. I'm worried, worried about that a lot. I keep dropping the phone. Excuse me. That's okay. Uh, and the exact timing is not going to be normal. It what? really depends on the success or the definition of the failure of the census collection for the rest of 2020. Is there and anything just now the census workers are starting to head to the houses? Um, is there anything that can be done about the census? I mean, I've, I, I, I haven't heard a whole lot. It just sounds like it's one of those things that once you screw it up, you can't unscrew it up. Um, what what yeah. can be done? There's a lot of debate, and I think it's intellectually honest debate, about how much you can project numbers based on data you have. I don't know how much the census has resolved that. Um, Georgia's collection of census data is below the national average thus far. And um, the local leadership, state leadership, uh, says they're paying attention, but I'm really nervous about it. I think that hypothetically, it could evolve the rest of the year, that they're going to have to do more data projections on census than data actually counted noses at the door. And That's a problem. that has been... Uh, George, you may know more about, you may know a lot about this, but there's, there's a debate about whether you take data and project a number yeah. to that benefits. I mean, you can argue it benefits uh, low income and people who are invisible. You right. can argue the other way. Except that it's almost certainly a partisan argument. Like what will end up happening is Republican yeah. lawyers and Democratic lawyers will get themselves in front of a federal judge and they'll argue algorithms. Like exactly. whose whose methodology is legally acceptable, um, and which means it might actually take a little while. Like there's, and especially since there's an emerging change in the way the Supreme Court is looking at apportionment and 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 these things. The Constitution, and I'm not a lawyer, so just bear with me. But the Constitution calls for an actual enumeration it's supposed to be a head count like the idea that you're projecting based on data is not like a strict reading of the law says you shouldn't do that at all here's um, the only thing that i'm i'm confident about all of that is is part of the very complex discussion here's the thing i'm confident about and i say publicly all the time there is a greater degree of intellectual honesty in the court system than there is in the political chamber there is a greater opportunity to have an analysis of evidence and expert opinion and information in a federal court than there is in the Georgia Senate. Yeah. Well, I hope you're right. Um, <laughs> I'm expecting, oh, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. It's just, I've had been, I've been having this, the, the census argument and the apportionment argument with political operative types for the last two or three weeks. It's weird that it just came up. Um, the, uh, I don't expect, I expect Gwinnett to pick up some stuff. I think the cab's probably going to go even like it's, you know, in relative terms, I don't think that we're going to gain or lose much of anything. Um, 
but Gwinnett's got to pick up three seats probably in the in the Senate and in the House, in the State House. Um, maybe four could be, maybe. Um, but if you if you say that doesn't make sense, but if DeCam is not going to stay, even if. Well, you, you've got it, what you're guessing about, and this may be what you're saying, is that the growth will be so strong in the north and the loss will be so strong in the south yes. of the state that, George, that DeKalb County right in the middle will be the same. Pretty much. That's what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I'm thinking, that we're not going to, like, we've got, the delegation is, I think, 16 people in yeah. the house. 16. And, I, and I'm expecting it to probably be about 16 people, you know, two years from now. Uh, but the lines will change. Um, yeah. And I don't think, so here's the thing. Like, I don't know if there's space in anybody's head for a radical rethink around like what the district lines look like because the long, skinny, ridiculous, I mean, but that's what worked. Like that passed muster with the Justice Department on the first go. But all that's yeah. history. All that's gone. None of that yeah. matters anymore. Uh, Preclearance doesn't matter anymore in this round. So this is our, isn't this our first census without a preclearance? It is. We still is. have constitutional protections, allegedly. Uh, yeah. But I, I, no, I don't think in my circle, I have not heard any discussion about redrawing of lines, but um, that will come. It's just going to come in a different way and a different timetable based on the emergency of COVID. So this is a this is inside baseball question. Do you anticipate any retirements? There are always might... lots of retirements at the end of a decade. We already turn over forty percent of the house every you know three, four years. So, I mean, yeah. That, yeah, I mean, I'm a long serving person, but the turnover is already pretty high. And this year, particularly, um, the question in the house, this is house talk. There are a lot of older chairmen who have been around a long time. Tom McCall, uh, chairman of agriculture, been there 30 years, retired. What is David Ralston's plan? What is David Ralston's plan? I mean, if David Ralston, <clears throat> suggested, and he, he's not impacted by um, by reapportionment, really, because he's, he's just, he's got, you know, already got several counties, so he, yeah. um, what is his plan? Is he going to serve another five years, or does he need to take the next five years and really concentrate on earning some money? I mean, he is in his 60s. Um, what's his plan? That's how I think. Because once he decides to leave, uh, there'll be a whole swat of people. Well, obviously, when, they're, when the Democrats take over, whether it's this year or 22, there's going to be mass exit of the Republicans. And there's going to be mass intro of new young Democrats. Yep. Yep. Um, so we're, we're coming up on the end of the show. Uh, and I should point out that it is raining and storming. So there's an outside yeah. chance that we're going to get cut off. And if that happens, we'll, we'll wrap it up. My power just blinked. So, you know, uh, yeah. real quick, real quick, if we can get to it, uh, a reader asks, what can we do to help, uh, suggest ways to get people to register to vote real quick. And then we'll wrap it up. Think I about president Trump being in the White House on January 21st. Imagine that. And go and think about the motive, how that would motivate you to go vote. How can we help register people? How can we help people register though? Maybe people who don't have access uh, to uh, these services. What would be a way that we could help others? MVP. Get a driver's license. Go ahead, George. Yeah. I was going to say like you can find Right now, if you go to mvp.ga.gov, you can you can pull up information and you can get yourself registered today. Um, and it is not too late. Mary Margaret. Sorry. Let's go. Any any library, any uh, when you change your driver's license, but the online voter registration in Georgia is easy and uh, people will help you do it. 
Sounds good. Well, um, I'm going to I'm gonna go ahead and call it there because we, we do have five minutes left, but the power is blipping, and I don't want, to, want us to get Same. unceremoniously cut off. Thank you both so much, uh, Mary Margaret Oliver. I, I appreciate your public service, and I appreciate Elena's public service as well. I hope you'll join us again because this has been a really great discussion, uh, and I'd Please love for you to see you. I'm happy to come anytime. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Uh, so this is the Decaturish.com Twitch show. Uh, we will be back on Friday at 6 o'clock. Please join us then. Uh, have a good evening, everyone.